But actually, it's not until you zoom out to the five year view that you look at and say, oh my God, it's gone up 100%. Well, how did that happen? Well, it happened day by day, up and down, little swings, little marginal gains, compounding. It's all the stuff we talk about, isn't it? Hey everybody, it's John Lamerton here alongside my good friend and business partner, Mr. Jason Brockman. We are here for another episode of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast, where as always, it is our job to help you get more customers and make more money without just working harder. So without further ado, let's dive straight into this month's episode. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Ambitious Lifestyle Business Podcast. As always, we are here to help you design your business to deliver the lifestyle that you truly want. Um, we are joined today by Michael Lieberman, um, one of our one percenters and owner and founder of Printed Editions. Um, Michael is an art dealer who started off learning to become an optician at university, then decided that op- ophthalmology is that the right term wasn't the route you wanted to go down um, looked at becoming a chartered accountant went backpacking around South America um, landed his dream role as an internal auditor for Britvic um, before discovering that actually moonlighting as an art dealer was so much more insp- inspirational and inspiring so how did we end up here Michael <laughs> um Fundamentally, I didn't check my answers when I did my A-levels. <laughs> the consequences have been, you know, another 30 years on top of that. So, um, yeah, I, you know, at school I wanted to be an optician. Uh, I like the sciences and I like business and I wanted to combine something with the two together. Um, but ultimately I screwed up my A-levels. Um, in retrospect, I don't think... Um, dyslexia was uh, fashionable or it was legal back in the 80s which is now it's more than illegal now so um, I think that was an influence on it um, and then didn't know what to do after a level so did business studies degree course didn't know what to do during that so like a lot of people did accountancy again couldn't get through the exams backpacked as you said um, found myself came back um, and then ended up I was a management accountant, which are basically easier exams. Um, worked from some great companies, travelled around the world as an internal auditor, um, but never really enjoyed it. Just wasn't for me, numbers and details, and just the actual work wasn't for me. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I stumbled into becoming an art dealer. I, I love the fact that if you're not very good at exams, what you should do is become a manager. <laughs> <laughs> very true yeah, absolutely delegate yeah absolutely so how did you how did you discover the love of art I think I've always been interested in it my parents used to you know pull my brother and sister and I around museums and art galleries kicking and screaming when we were young but I've always just liked images I just I think that's I just I can register with images mm. And then, um, yeah, you know, in my single days, I was living in a flat on a Saturday night, I had nothing to do. Walked past a local art gallery who had some exhibition on, which happened to be a Rolf Harris. Um, oops. Um, he's offering out free champagne. So, yeah, let's go for it. And then um, he explained to me how the art market worked. There's a secondary market and a primary market. And... Um, yeah, there's a, there was a print on the wall and he, it was like £300. And he said, if you buy it from a concession in um, Selfridges at the time, you could buy it for £150. So I was like, well, how does that work? He explained it. And then so I went to Selfridges, bought it, stuck it on eBay, got 200 quid for it or whatever it was and thought, yeah, there's something there. You know, it's like, I've just made 50 quid. And then... I just got hooked and I ended up having a whole room full of Rolf Harris prints. <laughs> this is when he was a big artist. This was back when you could yeah. actually sell that for a decent amount of money, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had a series on Sunday nights, on BBC Two, I think it was, where he used to copy a very famous painting. Mm. And then he got involved with the publisher who produced limited edition prints that he signed. 
and people were buying them and they were paying all over eBay and I was finding art galleries all around the UK selling his stuff. And then one day an art gallery who I bought from phoned me up and said, that print you bought last week, I buy it from you for double what you paid for it. It just set alarm bells off. I was like, yep. what are you doing? Um, and I just got hooked. And then, and then just discovered other artists and made money, got my money back, lost money, but I didn't care. I just was hooked. Just loved mm. it. Loved it. Um, Do you think you always had that gene in you? Because you mentioned, obviously, you wanted to go into business first. You loved the business of the ophthalmology. Yeah. You, you studied business studies. You had that that inbuilt gene in you that just loved to trade? I think so. I think so. I come from a, you know, being a nice Jewish boy, I've come from an East End family of traders. My dad, my grandparents, my great-grandparents. I found out last week my great-great-grandparents, you know, were all traders because that's what they had. That's what they did. So there's been, you know, there's always been part of me that, that likes you know, if you buy something and you sell something for more than what you paid for it, easy. In theory. <laughs> <laughs> easy. <I> like <laughs> yeah, it's just how you do it. And, you know, you know, I had an idea as a teenager to sell a million T-shirts and make, a mil- and make one pound on each T-shirt, a white T-shirt. Sounds simple, but not that I'd tried it, but that was my sort of uh, philosophy on it. Do you remember the um, uh, the million pound pixel website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Similar thing. So this guy just went, well, a website is ma- a web page is made up of pixels. So if I've got a million pixels, I could sell advertising one pixel advertising for I think it was a dollar. So if I sell a million pixels of advertising for for one dollar each, that's a million dollars. They called it the million dollar homepage. Yeah. Uh, and sure enough, yeah. People went for it um, because it was new, it was novel, it was, it was an idea. But that started with a very basic premise of if I sell one pixel for one dollar, I make a dollar. If I sell 10,000 pixels, $10,000. Great. If I sell a million pixels, it's a million pounds. It's, yeah. Sometimes we do overcomplicate business. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm. I'm intrigued by the business of art because art is so subjective. Um, I, I'd imagine there are principles behind it. You know, if you buy an established artist, if you're buying a Picasso or a Turner, not so much a Harris anymore, um, but you know what you're getting is likely to um, accumulate. It's likely to actually increase in value. I've I've got some pieces on my walls which are worth, I've got some pieces that are worth more than I paid and I've got many pieces that are worth less than I paid because my criteria for the purchase was, I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do I avoid losing my shirt? <laughs> uh, the art world is um, one, of the art, one of the last unregulated industries or markets, completely unregulated. And like a lot of um markets recently is now particularly for contemporary art it's people buy it as a commodity to make money so your criteria for buying what you like on your walls is really the correct thing is you buy something because you like it yeah you're going to enjoy it it does something to you and you're going to walk past it every day for the next 30 40 years on your wall you know so that is the, the key thing of buying art. Um, but now people, you know, want to make money. So there's a lot of speculation going on. There's a lot of hype going on, um, which causes some artists to rocket and some ones, yeah, who, who try, don't jump on the bandwagon to, uh, to sort of fall away. Yeah. So, um, and anybody who says, buy this because you're going to make money, <laughs> selling it yeah. <laughs> yeah you know it's luck it's it's complete luck you know there's some very well known established artists who you know uh over time the prices go up because they come rarer and they're in museums but when people buy them it doesn't mean the prices are going to go up 
where there can be, you know, a local street artist, you know, in Plymouth mm. who has an Instagram account and within, you know, a week of being able to, you know, graffiti on a wall can make, you know, millions of pounds because he's social media, basically. Yeah. That's the key yeah. thing. It, it's standard business model, I guess, of supply and demand, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you can, buy an original, if you can afford it. Uh, if not, limited edition prints. Are you better off buying dead artists? It depends on the artist. Mm -hmm. it depends on the artist. If you're buying blue chip artists like Warhol, there's always a, yeah, there's market prices. They're, they're set in stone, you know. Yeah. He's died in the 80s, so um, you're more likely to liquidate something get your money back or make it make a bit of money on famous dead artists. But, you know, there's other artists, live artists, you know, as I say, price gone through the roof. Um, I'm going to take a punt that Rolf Harris, when he's dead, his art's worth less than when he was alive. Well, Rolf Harris is unique because, you know, he's, um, he's serving time. <laughs> we sort of killed his market. But, yeah. um, you know, if if God forbid, say Banksy died tomorrow, I don't know how that affects his prices. Mm. Yeah, there's other big artists who people think, oh, when they're going to die, I'm going to make a fortune because I'm holding his, his artworks. Mm. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't. Work I suppose like they become that. very limited when you, when when the artist dies. I suppose, isn't it? The, the yeah. Art. Well, they can't. You know, they can't produce anything. So. Um, mm. So yeah, but it, it, the answer is it just depends on the artist. It literally depends on the artist. Definitely. Now, one of the things that really caught my eye, and the reason we wanted to get you on the podcast today, Mike, was kind of back at just before Christmas, we had our 1% Club Christmas party. And we went around the room and we asked everybody to kind of tell us the highlights, what they were most proud of this year. And I think when we came to you, you kind of said, well, it's been an all right year, you know, haven't, haven't done too much of note except this 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 and you reeled off about five or six different things that you'd done yeah. to stack up in your business yeah. that actually when you compounded all six or seven of those items made a big big difference and i think it was i always like to kind of reference the steve jobs quote from i think it was a stanford um commencement speech you can only connect the dots looking backwards yeah. and i think it was when we looked back over the last sort of year of your um, your your business life was like actually, yeah, you've you've achieved quite a lot in the last year, haven't you? You may not notice it from week to week or month to month, but actually, when you look back over the year, you you'd had a pretty stonk in twenty twenty one, hadn't you? Yeah, no, I had I had some real successes, and um, yeah, as I say, just marginal changes and just implemented a, a few things, it just. It adds up. So, you know, again, like a lot of one presenters, all my ideas for my changes have come mainly through recommended books to read. So actually on New Year's Day, I sort of stacked all the 15 books I'd uh, read this book on the dining room table and my kids were shocked because they just don't read and I'm demanded. Um, but yeah, it was the ideas coming from those and none of it's rocket science. And all of it can be applied to basically any business. But, um, yeah, I applied it to my business. So, you know, simple things like systematically putting prices up. You know, not a lot, but, you know, if I put £10 up, on my because I charge galleries of subscriptions to come on my website. Um, yeah, if I put £10 up a prescription per gallery and I do it in batches and I, you know, 20 galleries a hit. Yeah, you know, that's an extra 200 pounds a month. And I'm not, I haven't done anything different, literally done nothing different. Um, so it's things like that. It's things like, you know, I get customers who, or galleries who leave me and just being equipped to try and keep them on board. And my success rate's pretty good. I don't keep them all on board. Lost one yesterday. Um, but it doesn't matter because I know I'm going to get more on board. Yeah. Um, so, 
I think the big thing for me, I realised at the end of the year, was actually reading you, your Evergreen Assets book, which made me think, actually, I want to turn my whole business into an asset. Hmm. Not just create lots of assets, you know, whether it's PR or marketing packs or whatever it is, videos or content. Yes, I've got to do all that, but actually make the whole business an asset. So, so for me, you know, remembering my old accountancy days with trepidation, you know, like all assets, you know, at a higher level, it's either, you know, short-term asset or long-term asset. It's either fixed or current. Assets depreciate. Need to invest in assets to keep the value going up. So applying those basic principles, again, from bottom up, sort of just filters, yeah, it just creates basically a classic asset, really. Long-term versus short-term, I like that, because I think we see a lot of, and one of the things we're always banging on about in, you know, on this podcast, in my books, in the 1% Club, is long-term thinking, and it's something that I think I've really embraced over the last year is what I thought was long-term thinking. What It's, it's what people define as long-term, you know, is long-term, yeah. you know, for, for a lot of publicly traded companies, long-term is two quarters. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm thinking 20 years in the future, 30 years in the future. It's thinking super long-term. Um, you had a gallery, I believe, tried to cancel their membership towards the back end of last year and then realised that they weren't thinking long-term enough because they'd made rather a large sale, didn't they? Yeah, well, I get this. It's, you know, some, for me, some galleries like customers, either they get it or they don't get it. And there's always a few that sort, sort of get it. And this one particular gallery who's very well established, uh, Spanish, they've been moving for a few years. I then... Um, they do up for renewal at the end of, uh, I think it was September. It's only like 500 quid because they've been with me for a long time. So, um, so, and they refused to pay it because they hadn't made any sales. So my business model is I generate leads for them. I can't control their sales because you can't buy on my website. I don't set prices. I don't negotiate. I don't, there's nothing I can do. It's, not, it's beyond my control. I've given them loads of leads, and that's, that's as far as I can take it. Anyway, I, using some of the techniques in these books, I've managed to keep them on board, um, and they, put, they renewed. And then, yeah, two weeks later, they sold, I think it was a, a print by Matisse, uh, for $180,000. <laughs> and and um, part of me, you know, thought, God, you know, Shit, this work. <laughs> this really does work after yeah. 10 years. This shit does work. Um, but yeah, he was like unbelievable. And you know, I've got him in writing saying he's you know, he's gonna subscribe to me for, for the rest of his life. Maybe a long life. I hope he's 18, but I know he's in his 70s. Um but yeah, no, it was, it was a great result. But I hadn't done anything different. I knew it's particularly with the online world, things happen. Yeah from anywhere at any time from any place yeah. but, if you, but you know as I said to this guy if you don't have a presence no one's going to ever find you no it's and if you know that you've got systematically you've got leads coming into your business yeah. and you know that for every 200 leads you've got in you get a sale then you know that over the long term with enough data this works the model works but if you were to look at a three-month snapshot and say well we had 28 leads no sales doesn't work does it you've got to zoom out it's like looking at the stock chart of you know of a publicly traded company and looking at the day-to-day levels and say well this doesn't work you know it's gone down 2.8 percent oh let's look at the monthly figures oh yeah it's it's kind of broken even well actually it's not until you zoom out to the five year view that you look at and say oh my god it's gone up a hundred percent well how did that happen well it happened 
day by day, up and down, little swings, little marginal gains, compounding. It's all the stuff we talk about, isn't it? Yeah, no, true. Absolutely. You know, sort of comparing, you know, when I look at my Google Analytics, I don't look on a daily basis because you drive yourself nuts. You know, you'd look at it maybe once a week, once a month. And it's a trend, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We've, I mean, we obviously we get it from 1% Club as well. So we, we have a similar thing. So obviously it's a monthly membership. And for some people in some months, their return on investment will be zero because they've not come on a coaching call. They've not got any value out of it. Other, you know, the, ne- the very next month, they could come on a call, get one idea, and all of a sudden they get 20 times their, their investment. But yeah. you, it's no good saying, well, what have, what have you done for me this month? <laughs> because it's a long-term strategy. It's a long-term mindset. And I think the more business owners can embrace a long-term mindset. I've, I've been, geez, I've been part of mastermind groups where I've been paying a thousand pound a month to be part of the group and I haven't attended a meeting for 10 months of the year. But then I go to one meeting and I get one idea and my year's membership is paid for. In in that moment, um, your gallery owner has, you know, with that one sale has paid for the next, what, 40 years, 50 years of membership? Absolutely, yeah. You know, similarly, I've had galleries who, Probably have never sold anything for me for years and years and years and years. Um, but they want to be part of it, and maybe one day they will something, will sell something. Yeah. They just want to be associated with it, and um, yeah, their attitude is, yeah, if I'm not there, then no one's ever going to find me. I want to take you to task, Michael. Yeah. I want to take you to task. John alluded to it earlier with the, the coaching call before Christmas where it was, oh, yeah, I haven't done anything this year and here are all the compounded things that I've that I've actually done and that's that's actually been brilliant. Yeah. Several yeah. times on this, so far during this podcast, you've said, I haven't done anything differently. I've not made any, you know, th- 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 this just happened by miracle or fluke or whatever else. And I'm going to take you to task on that because I don't think that's necessarily true. I think you've done lots of changes. I, I my word for you was innovation and that, and that, and I think that's, that's what you've, you, you, you seek to do every kind of month, every time you're thinking about stuff, certainly every one-to-one call that we have, you're always looking at the new angle that you can do for your galleries to look after them. What new innovation can you put in and I think um and, and that's not done by fluke or chance that's yeah, done yeah. by design and um and yes yeah, so I want to take you to task on that a little bit yeah no that's fair enough that's fair enough maybe if I'm so used to doing what I'm doing I don't really notice things but yeah I, yeah I am constantly innovating I, you know I don't want to get a call ages ago about being comparable to particularly your big competitors mm-hmm. I can't you know I can't. I'm a one-man band. Um, I've got on one end of the uh, dining room table. My wife, through COVID, is now the other end of the dining room table. You know, and I'm not. I'm competing against companies that are floated on stock exchanges, with big teams and big budgets and venture capital behind them. You know, so I've got to innovate just to, to stand out and. Um, yeah, you know, big enough market for everybody to take a piece out of, and I don't need a big piece of cake. I just don't need. It. Um, but I, I love the fact that you're always trying to seek to add value. Yep, you had a price rise, absolutely fine, and that, that's something you should be doing all the all of the time. That should be, you know, that that is you're paying more for your electricity, you're paying more for your internet, you're paying more for everything that you're doing. Yeah. So actually, why shouldn't the, the galleries do that? And, and, and pricing is one of those biggest obstacles I think lots of small business owners have. Is actually I can't charge them anymore because it's going to upset a lot of people. No, and uh, I must apologise for the. I, I saw somebody who was, who was apologising for it yesterday on their socials. They did a big chart. I was really sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to put my rates up. It was a hairdresser, a uh, kind of local hairdresser. He's like, I'm really sorry. I hate to do this. I haven't done it for so many years, but I'm going to have to do it now because the costs have gone up. And it's like, well, what are you apologising for? It's like, I've never seen a text from the large corporate companies like British Gas or whatever saying, I'm really sorry. It's April, but I'm going to put your bills up by the retail price index i haven't done that so actually yeah pricing there's my little rant for today um yeah but 
you have, are delivering value all of the time and you're delivering added value each and every month. You're innovating, you're adding new features, you're adding new ability, you're investing in their, your SEO and to improve their listings. You, you know, all of these things are kind of happening. Um, and you probably see that's your day-to-day stuff. That's the stuff that doesn't really, you don't think is doing anything different, but actually it is what is making the, the business successful for yourself, but also for the, for your galleries that are um, are on, on your on your site. Yeah, no, no, you're right. <laughs> Actually, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So I think one of the, you know, I'm trying to, again, I'm putting my galleries at the front of absolutely everything I do. You know, I am, I think since I've been with the 1% group, my job description has changed three times in a year. So when I signed up about a year ago, my I thought my job was um, I promote art galleries. And that's changed about six months ago to I'm now a marketeer. And now that's changed to I help my galleries, I help my customers. That is my job description. So that's shifting my focus on everything I do. Um, so I have to get their names in lights and promote the galleries. The art is almost secondary. You know, I'm lucky that my content, I can put one picture up as opposed to writing a blog for like a thousand words. I have, you know, I have more impact with one picture. You know, I'm quite lucky we're doing that. Um, but yeah, having the focus now of putting everything to make my customer, to help them achieve what they want to achieve. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's the, the change. So, you know, I'm now doing two newsletters a day, for example, which people think is an overkill. But actually, very few people actually unsubscribed for it I think they generally do because everybody's receiving too many emails but um, yeah I could do 10 emails a day but two at the moment seems quite quite a sweet spot Um, you know my social media is all about the galleries everything is about the galleries you know um, luckily I've invested in a good website Um, so the SEO I don't pay for any SEO and that's doing pretty good that's doing pretty good do i want a million visitors a day absolutely am i prepared to pay or can i afford it no no i don't need to get that many people a day yeah that's the advantage you've got over the blue chip companies with the massive budgets and the huge teams is actually you don't need that much of a slice of the pie you are nimble you can actually know your customers inside out you know who they are. They're not just another client. You don't need 5,000 clients to no. reach break even. <laughs> no, no. I've got about 130 on my books. My competitors have got about five, 6,000 galleries, mm. and they go for the, a lot of the, the big ones. Um, I get constant feedback. Some of the galleries are on these big competitors of mine. They're lost. They're just a little number. You know, at least on my side, they're very visible. You know, this is, you know, last, this, well, last year just gone. It was the first year I've been hand, uh, thank you, and Christmas cards to every one of my galleries. And the power of that is, was just, is off the clock. It's off the clock. So that's just one more little asset you put into play into your machine. And I know we talked on a coaching call this morning about you being the engineer of your machine and just seeing, well, actually, let me put this little cog in place, you know, a simple handwritten card. So great. You've done that for Christmas. Maybe you could do it twice a year, three times a year. I will. (laughs) I will. I will. And I'll send them some little gifts, you know, as and when, pencils or whatever it is. But, um, yeah, it's the personal service. Yeah. Personal service. That's what I, I'm going to butcher it, but there is a line I used a few times in Evergreen Assets um, around the retention section about, I'm here for you and I won't rest until you've got what you want. I'm here and I care. Yeah. And what you've done with the handwritten card there is, is just demonstrated that. It's, it's one tiny little way of demonstrating it, yeah. but it's a way that the big corporates, the blue chips, cannot demonstrate that they gen- that that individual genuinely cares about your success. 
in the way that you can because you've got a ratio of one to 130 whereas they've got a ratio of 83 to 5,000 and it just doesn't compute. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. You know, I think you get too big. Yeah. You can get too big and then um, then you're not niche. You're not, you know, you're just lost. You're just a number. You know, and I think can... you, you lifestyle is, is so important and I think that even spread from, from the exam days, to be fair. I'm guessing the, <laughs> the term lifestyle kind of take, took over a little bit there. You didn't enjoy the some of the work, so you changed your job. You went on a backpacking uh, year out kind of thing. Lifestyle just yeah. seems to thread through that quite a lot. And I guess if you have 5,000 clients, you're not going to have the lifestyle that you want. So you, you're engineering that lifestyle that you kind of, that you need now, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, probably like you, I, I've, I've got some friends who, um, they probably earn a million quid a year as lawyers, maybe more, two or three million quid a year, like serious lawyers. Well, they've worked, they've been on call for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last 25 years. They hate what they do, but they've got to pick up the phone. You know, I've answered the phone wearing a pair of shorts cut in my grass and made a sale. You know, cutting the lawn. You know, I love it. I love it. And I can't. I can't actually work eight hours a day. I actually don't have enough things to do to work eight hours a day every day. I'd burn out. I, I just, you know, once I've scheduled my social media, done my newsletters on a Monday and Tuesday, the rest is just, you know, time to think and develop the business. But I can't, it sounds really weird. I can't fill my time. <laughs> oh, I guarantee there are there are business owners listening to this now who, who say, right, Michael, if you if you've got some time on your hands, I've got plenty for you to do. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. You know, I I just make you laugh. So I do my um, social media posts once. Uh, I schedule them for every day, and invariably, I would do it whilst watching Good Morning Britain whilst having breakfast on the sofa. So, and I'm an early riser. So by about seven o'clock in the morning, I've done all my daily routines. I'm literally done from, for what I need to do. Yeah. The rest, to be honest, I don't know where the time goes, but I'm always busy, but um, yeah, I'm just working. I, I couldn't fill the days. I couldn't fill the days. I, my clients the, don't need the it. next thing that you can do to innovate for you for your clients or for your customers exactly a lot of thinking time a lot of um planning not scheduling and seeing what's out there absolutely and creating lots of assets so you know creating lots of graphics so if i do you know i've got to create like 130 graphics where i just do create almost like a poster an e-poster for a gallery so i had the name of the gallery and the name of the artists that they deal in and create it like a like a poster you see, you know, in our gallery. You know, I create those, and once they're done, what I'm doing is literally changing the, the image, refreshing it every month or two. It's done. I mean, you're ten years into your journey now, Michael, in terms of the business. So, is this? Do you think this is because you have optimized your machine? So you spent 10 years doing 80-20 analysis, figuring out what works. And I think I mentioned it on the call earlier, distilling what works to its simplest form so that when I wake up, I do this, 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 and this. And within two hours, my work, my what I need to do to get 80% of the results in my business is done. <laughs> Basically, yeah. So... My, one of my favourite quotes ever, do you ever watch Modern Family? Yes, yes. So Phil Dunphy, who's one of my heroes, his quote is along the lines of, while everybody's thinking outside the box, think inside the box. <laughs> because the inside the box is empty. There's no one in there because everybody's busy thinking outside the box. <laughs> so it's, it's just keep it really simple. You know, for me, people want to, you know, look for art. They go on a website, they find a piece of art, they click on it and inquire. 
that is it. They don't need to read about well, you need the biographies of artists for SEO and all that sort of stuff. You know, and if they want to know what's going on in the art world, go to other websites. I'm not going to, you know, I can't, I don't have the resources to tell you every exhibition that's happening in Los Angeles or Russia or Chang, you know, wherever. If you want to buy this piece of art, here it is, click on it, speak to the gallery. Done. There's nothing else to it. It's keep it really simple. So, yeah, and the, who's it? The Sunday Times, there's, a, who's it? there's an interview with someone and I can't remember who it was, but he, it ended with, do the simple things the best you can do them. And the rest sort of takes care of itself. So whatever you're good at, and you keep it simple, do that really, really well. Yeah. Really, and really keep well. doing that well for a long period of time. Think super long term. If you do the simple things, do them well, do them consistently, and you do them for a long time, you're going to succeed, aren't you? Well, yeah, because then that becomes, as Seth Godin says, you know, that comes off, that's, then you're authentic, aren't you? Because mm. every day he's, you know, he's, he's thinking about being authentic, he's being consistent. So if you're doing the same thing consistent every day, every week, and it's the same thing, then you're, then you're authentic. Yeah. It's really difficult actually for people to understand that to a certain degree, isn't it? I mean, uh, our business thrived. Uh, when John stripped everything back and had his one page marketing plan and did that every single day for years um, and, and, you know, bore the fruit from that uh, in, in terms of growing our business. But everybody we've introduced to that in our business have never, ever seen it <laughs> and never, ever followed it and never, ever kind of come to that conclusion that actually it would work. Um, and therefore, it, every time it's kind of fallen over is, is, is kind of, a, you know, where we fit a, a patch in our business. But that's always when we try to introduce that to somebody who's going to either run it for us or, or to, to look after that side of it for us. Yeah. Um, and, and that is something, yeah, it's really difficult. It's hard to understand why that doesn't seem to, to sink in with, with, with people, really. I think it's because they're not business owners. No one's going to think like you. No one knows what you know. No one has got the passion of what you know. You know, at the end of the day, they're, you know, they're paid a, a, you know, a salary and they go at the end of the night and sleep. You know, they're not going to get kept up. And it's too it. simple, isn't it? <laughs> simple things aren't going to work. <laughs> yeah, they're not bought into it. Or they haven't got skin in the game. You know, I love that expression. Mm. They've got no skin in the game. So whether it, you know, unless the business folds, they don't really, don't say we don't really care, but, the focus or the passion is never going to be the same as a, as a business owner, I don't know. I think there's, there's, a, there's an element as well of it must be harder than this. It can't be as simple as following a one page or it can't be as simple as just working two hours a day. It, it must be harder than this. It's got to be. Everyone, look around you. Everyone else is working hard. Therefore, yeah. we can, there can't be an easy answer. <laughs> no, that's right. Well, it's the same with all this lockdown, isn't it? You know, people, some business owners don't want lockdown because they want the employees, or don't trust the employees to do a full day's work. You know, they want to do a nine to five. And what you do during those hours, it's almost irrelevant. They just need that person to be the nine to five. But, yeah. you know, work from home, you, you can do it. You know, some jobs you can do in an hour or two, you know. You know, it's the same as a degree course. Most degrees you could do in a, in a year. Yeah. <laughs> Some six months, you know, but they drag it out. So it's, mm. God knows. Yeah, People still have got the new ways of working, I don't think. I think that might have been a Derek Sivers thing again, where he was told this is a four-year course, but you can do it in a year. All you need to do is read these texts uh, and again, it's eighty twenty analysis. Richard Koch did the same actually with eighty twenty principle, and he passed course. You know, again, probably four year courses in eighteen months by saying, "Okay, what subjects? What twenty percent of subjects are on eighty percent of the exams? I'm just going to study that twenty percent." Yes, there'll be some elements of the exam I've never heard of. I've no idea, but yeah. the the twenty percent that makes up eighty percent of the marks, I'm going to know that stuff inside out. Yeah. Um, and it, it just, yeah, it's it's studying the game and the mechanics of how 
things work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And seeing it from the other, from the the user point of view as well, not just because you may have an idea of what thing works, which often does, but you see it from the, you know, for me, the person who comes to my website. What do they expect to see? What don't they expect to see? Um, yeah, if you can focus on their objectives. Yep. Um, again, as mentioned this morning, you know, create a, like a, an avatar for your customer, or for your, your avatar for your employer, your for your employee, for your investor. You know, it really sets the mind straight. Yeah, it does. And focuses what you do. Definitely. I'm intrigued. So you've been with us for a year, just about now. I think that's that's fair to say. Um, how has your business changed in in that year? What what's different apart from the fact you changed your job title three times? What, <laughs> um, <laughs> what else would you say that One Percent Club's done to help you uh, with with the structure of your business? Uh, yeah, lots of things actually. Um, seeing other people of your other members, you know, what they go through, um, good and bad, you know, has been a real eye opener. You know, you, you see things on the news, you know, the economy's dipping, these businesses are going out, you know, suffering and all this sort of stuff. And there's been one or two people who have felt comfortable enough to air, you know, when they're going through some really dark times, you know, and I've been watching them, you know, speaking and I'm like, it's very humbling and it's, it's almost disturbing as well. It's very upsetting. But then you can see them coming out and the, the, the support the group gives is is brilliant, you know. Um, that's incredibly value, real value. Um, the accountability, definitely, you know, the one-to-ones on a Thursday, I haven't done... I could obviously do some more. <laughs> I could do some more. <laughs> really need to. Yeah, they do happen every Thursday, not every month or two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, they've been valuable. You know, the um, the group calls, different subject matters. You know, they're not all appropriate to me. You know, there's one the other day about um, teams and everything. You know, I, I don't have a team, but I still yeah. watch it because I still get something out of it. Exactly. I'm a next call is on leadership. So as a you know company <laughs> one, how to lead yourself better. <laughs> yeah. But I'll definitely watch it. There's definitely something I can get out of it. There'll definitely be something. Um, yeah, recommendations on the various books have been invaluable. Mm. For not being a reader, you know, I just, to give you an example, someone I did my O level English literature, I think it was, a couple of books to read. And do you remember um, Let's Revise? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that summarized the books. So I didn't read that. So a mate of mine summarized the Let's Revise summary and i i love summary of the summary i like it yeah and 80 20 in the 80 20 <laughs> I, did. I did i don't know how that works out statistically um i got a b you know so from not reading to now reading you know i'm not gonna read loads of books but um and strategically choose the books for what i need mm. um yeah it's really helped so that's changed me from you know the 80 20 rule Absolutely. Well, the principles in the uh, pumpkin plan. Absolutely. Um, what else? This is marketing. Been very, very good. John's three books have been very good. And just taking bits out of those uh, for the bits that I need. Yeah, definitely. You know, it forced me to create content. Forced me to create green assets. Yeah, yeah. it's. Um... James Marks, who um, obviously we did a podcast with him about a year ago now, um, but he, again, on the coaching call this morning, said that his main goal for the year is to keep developing the business owner. And that's what you've alluded to there, is that, is that constant, let's work on myself, let's work on my personal development. Because um, James, I think he mentioned it on the podcast, actually, he was told by his very first mentor, probably a similar time to you started your business, Michael, about 10 years ago now, it doesn't matter that, you've got no money coming in. It doesn't matter that you've got a fledgling business that you've never started before. If you develop the business owner, the business will follow. And again, it's having that long-term mindset, super long-term, because 
of all the assets you could create, and you've talked about creating assets within the business, thinking inside the box, but you've also talked about creating your business as an asset, but the greatest asset you will ever have is yourself. Because if you sell this business and start another business, you get to take yourself and all, your, all that personal development work with you. <laughs> you know, if your business, you know, heaven forbid your business fails and, you know, it goes away and, you know, circumstances change or as many businesses last year forced to close circumstances outside of your control doesn't matter if you've got yourself because you can take the skills the mindset the ethos that you've built up and take that and use that attention somewhere else yeah no absolutely yeah it's all transferable skills isn't it yeah it's all transferable skills but it all comes down to the same principles you know it's all about people at the end of the day. And the load box say people buy from people and deal with people. But it, 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 it is. is. It's, it's, it's a relationships game. I think I might have said that once or ten times in Evergreen Assets. <laughs> yeah. It is. I had a real opener a couple of weeks ago, actually. There's, so for ten years, I've sent emails out to, to galleries saying, you should sign up to my website because of this, this, and this. A few weeks ago, somebody sent me that same email, trying to get me to sign, and I read it and I froze because there was no way on this planet I was going to sign up to it. Yeah. Just because of the wording of it. It was so cold, and I'm thinking, my God, I've been doing this for 10 years. That exact same email. So that's going to change, and I need to make it more personal, you know. Yeah. Definitely more personal. So, um yeah, no, it is definitely all about people, definitely. Yeah, so what I love there is if you extrapolate that out and say let's, so we've, for 10, 10 years we've had this email in play, this asset has been in play and it's served you well, it's got you where you are now. But we take that asset out, we, we polish it up, we improve it, we put a brand new shiny one in place yeah. for the next 10 years, that, that one email improves your conversion rates by two percent your open rates by another three percent and we extrapolate that out over the ten thousand people that you put through the system over the next 10 years yeah. that results in an extra let's i don't know an extra 50 um subscribers paying average of 500 pounds a year well that's twenty-five thousand pounds a year 10 years let's call it a quarter of a million pounds of additional revenue for one bit of work, tweaking one email. Yeah. And that's all it takes, isn't it? Yeah. That's one thing. And then tomorrow you can work on something else. <laughs> yeah. no, if you can find the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. But no, that's, that's all it takes. It's just looking what you've got and sort of changing or trying to improve it, trying to tweak it, trying to as my old boss used to say, sort of exploded out. Take every little element of it and tweak that element and tweak that element. And again, compounding sort of separate elements within, even within an email. So whether it's your rates, whether it's the wording, how you end the message, there's so much you can do. Mm. But if you don't, then it's going to stay the same. Well, you get left behind, basically. You've alluded a couple of times to quiet time and the time spent thinking rather than doing. Yeah. How impactful has that been for you? Yeah, massive. Massive. Just because I've, you know, again, like a lot of business people, you work, a lot of people work, they're so busy doing the day-to-day -day stuff. They don't, um, they don't think of how to grow the business or develop the business because they've got bills to pay, they've got customers to service, they've got orders to fulfill, they've got emails to answer, all that sort of stuff. And the way the time's flying at the moment, you know, it's just whizzing by. So, you know, I, I think I took my fourth accelerator for about two or three months late, um, early, uh, late last year. And it just went by and I was like, oh my God, I've done two months and all I've done is post on Instagram for, you know, for two months. I haven't done anything. But, um, yeah, having ideas and then putting them down on a piece of paper and then them. 
as you heartily recommend, is um, yeah, he's, do, he's doing it. It's not just having the ideas; it's actually implementing it and having the balls to do it sometimes. And if they work, great. If they don't work, you know, nobody died. You know, you just try it again. You know, so. <laughs> Taking you to task again. Two yeah, months, I yeah. just posted a bit on Instagram and that's, and I don't feel like I've done anything else. I've read 15 books. I've, done, yeah, <laughs> I've taken that knowledge. I've taken that action. I've got a plan for 2022. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I suppose. I suppose that's my, uh, that's my nature. <sighs> I can't believe I've made it this far into an episode without referencing Warren Buffett, but this <laughs> is the Warren Buffett effect of Warren Buffett spends... 98% of his day reading. What do, people you say to the average person on the street, what does Warren Buffett do? Oh, he invests in the stock market. He's a he's a stock trader. No, he's not. He he pulls the trigger maybe once a year on a purchase. Most of the time he deploys what he calls sit on your ass investing, which is literally as it sounds, doing nothing other than reading, thinking contemplating pondering and then only when he is absolutely sure that this is a home run does he take a pitch it's, he says you don't need to swing at every pitch if um he said the greatest advice i could give to any newbie investor is to picture a card with like a hole punch and every time you make an investment every time you make a purchase in the stock market i punch a hole and you've only got room for 10 holes on this card in your lifetime. Right. So that alone is the greatest advice you'll ever have. Only pull the trigger 10 times. Spend more time considering whether to pull the trigger than just doing. But yeah. you've still got to pull the trigger. <laughs> yeah, no, true, true. Yeah, now I could have come up with some ideas you know, to really improve my business, but they would probably make me more money, but I'd have to spend invest a shed load of money and I would have to create so much work for myself. You know, I had the idea, like again, but it's following the bandwagon of creating like uh, an auction site on my website or even being able to buy it on my website just fulfill through other galleries. It sounds simple, you know, but logistically it is a nightmare. You know, for a start, I'd have to employ people, which, to be honest, no one to do. I don't want to do. But, you know, shipping something to Paris from a gallery that's on my website in Japan, mm. you know, the legislation and regulations around that, if something gets lost in transit or damaged in transit, you know, I would spend a month or two trying to sort that out without doing any work. Mm. So I could take, you know, this gallery that sold a print for one hundred eighty thousand dollars. You know, if I if I took a one percent commission by now, great, two percent, three percent, great, but it's not worth it. No, for, for me, for me, it's not worth it. So yeah, those decisions, yeah, great idea, but actually, when you think about it, and not pulling the trigger is probably saved me hours and thousands of pounds you know and stress and you know you just don't need it yeah the stress is is one of the key things i think isn't it it's the amount yeah. of work you could put in and everyone has got opportunities within their businesses there's very few business owners who haven't got a clue what they could do they all got oh actually we could do this and we could bring this new revenue stream in and we could expand into this new territory or this new product range i could hire this person like you could do all of that but then you end up with you know what what gordon ramsay finds every time he goes into a restaurant on kitchen nightmares and he's got the 14 pager and it's you know the tex-mex chinese indian pizza steakhouse menu it's why is it a weird convoluted bloated mess full of frozen ingredients done in a microwave because well we tried to do too much right what is what's the first thing he does right simple one pager there's three starters three mains three desserts simple fresh ingredients simple things done well consistently ah there we go <laughs> that's it 
<laughs> you ended our last lesson <laughs> in today's ALB podcast. Um, yeah. We always ask one question, and that is uh, ALB is ambitious lifestyle business. What does that mean to you? Um, I agree with your sort of definition of you know doing what I want, when I want, how I want, if I want. Not allowed to agree with John. <laughs> <laughs> It is. I think that's basically what it sort of distills down to, really. You yeah, know, it's living the life you you truly want, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I could work really hard, end up with a really nice car. My attitude, well, don't get me wrong, I've got a very good social life and all that, but where am I going to drive it to? I, I don't, who cares? I've got a nice, I don't, I don't, for me, I don't need those sort of things. Yeah. Got other interests, and I don't need to work really hard to pay it. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got yeah, you know, family and my lifestyle and freedom, and that's that's what I'm about. That's what yeah. I'm about. I, I often talk about it in terms of smiles per gallon. So <laughs> you know, you could have a nice car, but actually, would the extra amount of money you're going to spend on that car or that house or that holiday or that watch or whatever gadget or doodad it is you're looking at? Are you willing to do the work to do that, <laughs> to actually earn that, you know, particularly post-tax? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't get the value of it. And when I, I'm sure you've seen it as well, when somebody drives past you in a nice car and they want you to look at their car, <laughs> I will purposely look the other way. I just completely ignore them. Yeah. <laughs> what effect it has on them, I have no idea, but it, it makes me laugh. It yeah. Makes me laugh. <laughs> You get more smiles to the gallon. I like it. Yeah, I get value out of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Michael, thank you ever so much for joining us on today's ALB podcast. Been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Ah, uh, pleasure, pleasure. Well, thanks again. All right. Thanks again, mate. See you soon. Take care. Bye. So there we are, another episode in the can. Um, how was it for you? Please let us know. Um, how do you listen to these podcasts? Uh, please leave a review on that platform let us know what we can do better what you like what you don't like and how we can improve to make this show even better for you we'll see you next time